Good afternoon and welcome to the Friends of Europe event on the ticking time bomb, cardiovascular diseases. The event will start in a few minutes. For the live stream, if you want to submit a question, please go to Twitter, Friends of Europe account, and use the hashtag FOE debate. Thank you very much. Our world has been transformed. Our world has been transformed. We have about 360,000 people, and that number is going up every day, who have died as a result of COVID-19, a brand new pathogen that the world has never seen before. And it has changed everything, and nothing will be the same. The way that we work, the way that we socialize, the way that we shop, the way that we move, the way that we interact with each other is going to change radically. And as we're living through this process, our health and care systems are the ones under the greatest strain. And they are the ones that are having to readapt very quickly. For the next hour, we're not going to have an autopsy event about what went wrong. We're going to look forward to see what lessons can we learn about how we configure our services in the future. What can we do on health care, health promotion, health prevention, so that our societies will be more resilient to COVID-19 and other future threats, whether they're infections or the growing problem of chronic diseases. So I'm delighted to introduce our first two speakers for you today. And our first speaker is going to be Professor Barbara Cassidy, She's the president of the European Society of Cardiology, and she will give us her opening remarks. Professor Cassidy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you said it right that the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has taught us some very important lessons. So first of all, let's have a sense of perspective. Uh, as you said, the COVID has caused about 360,000 deaths worldwide. Uh, mostly in elderly people. Just let's think about our uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, the cardiovascular disease is causing about um, 
18 million of deaths every year, a third of which uh, are premature, so be before the age of 69. So this is the scale of uh, a uh, pandemic, you could call, that we have somewhat uh, neglected, as in being a little bit complacent. Uh, the other uh, important uh, lessons that were learned is the uh, unintended consequences of communication and what happens when we do not have a rapid feedback uh, on our health data to actually detect trends. So we all know because it's been uh, very widely documented in the media that uh, patients who have the highest risk of dying of cardiovascular disease because they have uh, ischemic heart disease already or risk factors are also the same that uh, are more likely to have a severe COVID-19 infection and die of it. So as I said, this has been widely publicized in the media, uh, lay press, but uh, at the same time, we have been unable really to provide uh, the assurance that if patients with uh, um, non-COVID related emergency uh, would come to hospital, we would be able to provide uh, clean areas for them and uh, we would do um, point of care testing for them, the other patients and uh, uh, the personnel. And so, you know, they would be safe come, or relatively safe coming into hospital. So as a result of that, both uh, across Europe and uh, in other countries, uh, we have seen a 50% reduction in admissions of patients with acute coronary syndromes, that is heart attacks uh, and also strokes. And uh, this is tragic because uh, we know that we have a very strong evidence-based treatment for these patients, which can about of just the uh, in-hospital mortality, let alone uh, the morbidity and uh, the, the consequences of not treating them uh, if they survive it. Um, all of this, uh, to some extent, you know, unnecessarily. And also we have been unable to follow, we know now, but we have been unable to follow and adapt these trends, uh, adapt to these trends whilst they were happening so that uh, it's uh, uh, really uh, uh, highlight uh, the importance of having uh, uh, a rapid access to patients' data across Europe in order to learn from each other, to understand what is happening, to take uh, prompt action and uh, to save lives. The other point uh, that I think we learned is really um, I mean, I hate to say this in this uh, venue, but the uh, uh, how unnecessary uh, red tape is. So we have uh, cardiovascular disease has suffered uh, a lot in terms of innovation and investment because uh, we know we've heard many times that uh, trials are too big, too costly, too slow in cardiovascular disease and therefore the pipeline uh, is drying and there isn't a huge interest in investing. And we have seen with COVID that all of these uh, 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 delays are actually unnecessary because we have been doing things in a certain way for so long. It doesn't mean that uh, it is an intelligent thing to carry on and do it forever. We have been able to set up the trials in COVID in uh, very, very rapid Time. So the, the recovery trial, for instance, uh, has been, you know, had a delay of about nine days from uh, conception to launching. And with the help of uh, our health system, it has been able to recruit 10,000 patients in less than two months. So this is really something, a lesson that we really need to keep, you know, is something that is going to make a huge difference to cardiovascular disease uh, and, uh, and other conditions. And this is a really uh, an important message for Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cassidy. Some very interesting points that you make there, not least that the, the way that the health systems have responded 
to COVID-19 and even the health regulators that accelerated the processes. And that has shone a very sharp spotlight on some of the areas where we perhaps were not efficient and were slow and bureaucratic. So indeed, some interesting messages there. Let me turn to our next speaker, Mr. Jean-Luc Mercier, who is the Corporate Vice President for Europe, Middle East, Canada, Latin America regions for Edwards Life Sciences. So the COVID-19 has also been an unprecedented time for our life sciences industries. What can you tell us about the way they've been responding and how the intersection of our existing challenge of dealing with cardiovascular disease is overlapping with the COVID-19 reality? Jean-Luc. We need to unmute your microphone, please, Jean-Luc. That's it, thank okay. you. Good work. Okay, thank you. Sorry about it. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor for me to, to represent the cardiovascular industry. Um, it's a strategic sector of MedTech Europe, the trade association of the medical device industry. As Barbara uh, Casade just shared with us, the compounded effect of the aging population in Europe together with the current uh, pandemic crisis makes cardiovascular disease a real uh, time bomb for, for Europe. Today, engaging the combat with more aggressively uh, against cardiovascular disease has become more urgent since the COVID-19 pandemic. The reason being that there is a clear link between COVID-19, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. The World Health uh, Organization Europe is telling us that 65% of COVID patients who passed away at some form of cardiovascular disease. You can add to this challenge the fact that the rate of cardiovascular disease increased with age. In, and in two statistics are saying in 2040, 155 million Europeans will be over 65. So the scale of the problem will only augment with the anticipated aging uh, demography. The corollary of this situation is that if we don't work together to improve the medical care of this serious but often treatable disease, further pressure will be put on health service and our older population will become more dependent on others. The response to the COVID-19 pandemic is probably giving us some directional indication on how the medical care for cardiovascular disease can be transformed, transformed thus providing this population with the benefit of active and healthy aging. So what is so impressive about the, the response to this outbreak as is an exceptional convergence of action from several stakeholders engaged in health. First, you are all the European government provided specific guidance to the population, directed healthcare system to adjust to this patient population. Hospital adapting and added intensive care to capacity on a very short notice. Physician community and their staff have been working restlessly to treat those patients. Regulator address issue to avoid barrier to the free circulation of essential medical technology within the territory of the European Union. The EU Commission and the European financial institution together with member states have put together a package of measures for supporting economy. European and national medical society like uh, European Society of Cardiology, uh, produce gu uh, guidance to treat patients suspected of having COVID-19 and how to handle cardiovascular patients with urgent needs. Patient group like the Global Heart Hub have been a voice for patients, providing advice, offering guidance, and making the case for urgent care to be undertaken. Our industry, medical device industry, and more specifically, the cardiovascular industry, has done everything from providing tests to fast scaling up of production of ventilator and from rapid deployment of intensive care, diagnostic and equipment to personal protection gears. And all this has been delivered while securing that all emergency treatments required by the hospital cardiovascular team have been properly supported through timely delivery of cardiovascular therapy together with the right support by trained 
and well-protected industry personnel so that the team were in the best condition to intervene. The challenge we have today is how we can all support the next phase of the crisis. As government unveils their deconfinement plan, medical technology will once again be called upon to serve. And we will need to do it jointly with all stakeholders I mentioned earlier on. While it may have felt like normal life has been suspended since March, people have since developed new conditions. While those living with cardiovascular disease cannot press pause on their medical need, surgery and treatment for people suffering from progressive heart condition must be addressed rapidly as these needs have not changed. Indeed, many areas of care have developed significant backlog while hospitals had to refocus their activity on COVID-19. This is an important challenge that we need to take on immediately. And to do this, we can learn from our combined effort in tackling COVID-19. Imagine now what stakeholders can achieve together if we replicate the partnership we showed in tackling COVID-19 in our mission to address the cardiovascular time bomb. A time bomb that caused 1.8 million deaths last year and cost the European economy 210 billion. At MedTech, we call on, on all of us to come together to set a clear roadmap for a best-in-class patient pathway. We believe strongly that constructive collaborative partnership with patient, doctor, hospital, government, MedTech, and payer are needed to go even further to help alleviate Europe's cardiovascular disease burden. This involves rethinking the approach to hospital organization and healthcare provision based on low value intervention and sometimes inadequate funding of care. By investing smartly in value added innovation, we can aim to improve patient outcomes, minimize hospital stay, reduce rehospitalization, modernize healthcare system, and protect the most vulnerable senior population who has suffered disproportionately during this pandemic. We stand ready to answer this call to action, and we ask you to join us to take this unique opportunity to transform healthcare system for the benefit of the patient, hospital, and society at large. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Luc, uh, for, for your messages. And as a reminder, the audience watching us can submit questions in two ways. If you're watching us on Zoom, you can raise your hand. If you are using Twitter, you can use the hashtag FOE debate. Let, let me just uh, return to Professor C uh, Cassidy because when the outbreak started, we went into lockdown. Hospitals were empty. Appointments were canceled. Surgeries were canceled. And so what we've done is we've seen a massive drop in the number of patients with cardiovascular disease presenting in hospitals. Perhaps this is because the services are not available because nurses and doctors have been moved to intensive care. Perhaps it's because they're frightened of coming in. Professor Cassidy, what, what can you tell us about what might be happening? Where are the patients? And what might be the health impact of the fact that people are not coming into the hospitals? Professor Cassidy. Thank you very much. I think uh, you, you touched on a very important point there. So it is interesting actually to see, and uh, I, I can see from the administrative data from the United Kingdom, that the, from England actually, that the reduction in admission is actually preceding lockdown. So at the time uh, when uh, the first death was announced, uh, almost immediately after uh, we started to see a uh, very uh, substantial reduction in admission. So, uh, and this has been also reported very recently in the New England uh, from the Kaiser Permanente in, uh, in uh, California, exactly the same pattern. So the reduction is before lockdown. So it's not because uh, people are told uh, not to move from home uh, and, and all of that. So it is fear, you know, in all the surveys that have been done, uh, fear has been uh, uh, the most commonly cited reason for not presenting to the hospital and fear of infection. And so 
you're told you are very high risk and you are very likely to, much more likely to die of COVID if you catch it. And, uh, you know, you will try everything not to go to hospital. The other tragic thing is that uh, those who actually decided to go to hospital, it, it's very difficult to have uh, a, a, a ST elevation myocardial infarction at home, is an extremely painful uh, condition. Um, they arrive to the hospital late and late is a problem because as we know time is brain and time is myocardium and so uh, if we wait too long then those fantastic uh, treatment that we can apply to these patients become useless and that had two uh, at least two elements to it one was the uncertainty uh, do i go or, do, or don't uh, and i wait and the other one was the overwhelming of the ambulance service. So to ensure to answer your question, Tamsin, patients uh, have been at home and have died at home. Uh, and uh, and uh, some of them arrived to hospital late with uh, a, a um, clinical uh, picture, which uh, uh, we hadn't seen since... Uh, before thrombolysis, when people really arrive with massive myocardial infarction, massive loss of myocardium, and already in heart failure, uh, or uh, with ventricular, you know, with aneurysms of the uh, ventricular uh, chamber, the pumping chambers of the heart. So th this is what has happened. Okay, thank you. So this is an issue of concern, and perhaps as the lockdown eases and people start to move around more, we might see a surge of, of people and patients presenting into the healthcare system with cardiovascular symptoms that would need to be addressed. Um, let me just say, well, we were doing very well in Europe in terms of our longevity, but the report by the OECD that was published just last week said that there's been a slowdown in the increase in life expectancy, and that's largely due to us also slowing down our progress on cardiovascular disease. So we've called this session the ticking time bomb because even before COVID arrived, we weren't particularly doing very well in tackling cardiovascular diseases in amongst our populations. We were not doing as well as we should on the prevention and the promotion messages and in our treatments. So let's, let's now think what would be the impact of COVID, which has, has put this sharp spotlight on the fact that if we aren't got our populations in good health, they can't manage to be able to, to fight off a new pathogen. So let me um, ask perhaps uh, Jean-Luc Lemercier for the med tech industry. If patients are not coming into the healthcare settings, then are there things that can be done at, that are being stepped up by remote monitoring? Are there new tools and techniques, applications that are allowing people, particularly who are vulnerable if they've got cardiovascular um, conditions, to be treated and monitored and supported at home? Jean-Luc. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fair point. And this is something which we have seen emerging uh, during this uh, crisis, it was already there, meaning you had already some equipment of telehealth in a lot of countries, but it has been definitively uh, the utilization of those tools uh, have been uh, accelerated uh, during this period. And probably um, when this crisis will be over, it's probably something which is going to stay uh, in the practice and the relationship between a physician and their patient for monitoring and even for uh, some diagnosis possibly. Yes, it's definitely one learning from this situation, definitely. Excellent, thank you. I'm, I'm now going to invite our next two speakers to make their, their remarks before we have a, a broader conversation. So I'm delighted to introduce Brando Benefe, who is a member of the European Parliament from Italy. He's a member of the IMCO Committee, which is Internal Market and Consumer Protection. And more importantly, he's the co-chair of the MEP Heart Group in the European Parliament. COVID-19 has been a challenge unlike anything else to Europe and its institutions. It's raised important questions about solidarity and the capacity of countries to work together to find common solutions. 
What's your view um, from the European Parliament? How do you see Europe responding to this? And where do we go f forward in helping our health systems? First of all, thank you very much for, uh, for this uh, occasion of exchange. I already heard very interesting points from uh, the other speakers. And thank you for involving me. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, that one number is uh, staggering, that uh, I think not all uh, people in Europe are fully oh. aware. Um, we have uh, today more uh, people dying from cardiovascular uh, diseases than the sum of people dying from all cancers combined in the EU. And this is something that it's uh, um, uh, staggering because I don't think there is the, the, the level of understanding from our public. We are talking about uh, each year 6 million new cases and over 1.8 million uh, disease, uh, cardiovascular disease-related uh, uh, deaths in the EU. Uh, obviously, you already talked about the ticking uh, uh, bomb linked to the aging population. Uh, and also, we have to say that the, at the moment, the COVID-19 represents an additional risk for this um, cardiovascular disease patients. Um, uh, because obviously, on, on, on one side, now we, we, we see suboptimal uh, treatment uh, um, uh, in the context of, of context of healthcare systems uh, that are focused on, more on the um, COVID-19 pandemics for obvious reasons. Um, but also the, the, the data that we already have show that a considerable number of people who die from or are ho hospitalized in a, in a, in a complicated situation, uh, conditions uh, with uh, uh, COVID-19 are patients that have pre-existing cardiovascular uh, diseases. Um, so uh, even today, but just much, much before today, um, uh, fighting the cardiovascular diseases is a priority for EU institutions and policy um, makers. I have to say that in the last years, the attention to the topic grew constantly. Uh, in particular, the MEPs have become uh, a link between civic uh, society, uh, patients, experts, and the EU institutions, like uh, in the uh, group of the MEP heart, uh, heart Group, uh, as you already mentioned. Um, in, uh, in the last years, we, we launched uh, a few call uh, to action for a healthier Europe, um, especially um, uh, I could uh, 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 um, uh, precise uh, uh, a, a few uh, specific steps. Uh, the proposal to set up a EU joint uh, action, EU Commission and Member States, on structural heart disease to prioritize and implement harmonized plans to ensure that the di diagnosis of structural heart disease is included in all health checks of people over the age of 65 across Europe and to secure appropriate funding for early proactive and curative treatment of structural heart uh, uh, diseases so that people can return to normal life and contribute actively to uh, society. Clearly, in, uh, in this situation of today, with the pandemic reshaping our world and our health policies, we need to uh, discuss uh, a new normal. We must be prepared to protect the vulnerable population of cardiovascular disease patients because of the correlation, as I said, with, uh, also with the um, worst uh, uh, situations uh, for patients with uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, being uh, um, particularly uh, uh, dangerous when also accompanied by a cardiovascular uh, disease. So we, we need to work, as, again, as I said, on diagnosis, on the follow-ups and the treatment. Um, we need to have technologies ready that can help us to cope with the uh, challenges. Um, we need also to, um, to use technologies in, in uh, in, uh, in a smart way. So, uh, for example, where we can use it to reduce the length of hospital stay um, for, for people. Uh, as co-chair of this uh, MEP Heart Group, I would like to remember also our call on the European Commission to set up an ambitious, healthy aging policy at European level, making sure 
that uh, the aging population is uh, more resilient to epidemics um, and pandemics uh, with less impact on uh, healthcare systems. Obviously, being a young, relatively young MEP, I've been also working a lot on education, on, on health for younger people to uh, check and to be um, uh, conduct a lifestyle that prevents cardiovascular um, diseases. Um, we have been pushing as MEPs to organize with the Commission also a cardiovascular disease summit in the end of this year. We think that the COVID pandemic didn't change the urgency of doing it, uh, as I said, for its uh, strict, strict correlation. Finally, as a last point, I would like to say that we are, um, we are um, very much uh, uh, convi con um, convinced among uh, uh, a majority of MEPs already in the parliament. We can see that clearly from uh, the last uh, um, resolution we approved on the um, on the um, reaction to the to the pandemic uh, uh, crisis um, that we need more healthcare uh, action at European level. We want to use the existing uh, powers, but also discuss an expansion of the competences to have a real health union. At the moment, we have mm, still fragmentation and limits. We think. To, be, to, to, to conclude on a very political note, uh, as a politician, I need to uh, also <laughs> utilize uh, the, uh, the perceptions of people to push for political objectives. And obviously, uh, even if it's not the only topic where we need to strengthen the uh, competences at European level, the health care uh, sector is one where it's easy to explain and to convince people that today, after what we have seen, the limited also coordination, especially in the first phase of the emergency, that we need to expand the, these competences. So it's a topic that is also important more generally when we look at the need for reform of the European Union, that to look into that, because it's easy to understand for people because of what we have experienced in these, in these last months. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Brando. And as you said, n never let a good crisis go to waste without making a political point for change. And as you say, the European role in health has been very much limited in the past by small arguments about whose role it is and whose job it is. And as you say, COVID has pushed all of that aside, and we now have a clear passage forward with political commitment and engagement. And since yesterday, a brand new proposal for our EU health program with a significantly larger amount of money, 20 times more money than the previous program. Yeah. So we have many of the objections that limited our ambition for health at European level have disappeared as if by magic. So let me now turn to our next speaker to see what the European Commission could do with this new political will and its new ambition. So it's, I'm delighted to introduce André Riche, the Director for Health Systems, Medical Products and Innovation at the European Commission for the Directorate General for Health and Food Safety. André, congratulations on that huge announcement. Nine billion, what could we do with that? <laughs> Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, I will start from the small mathematic correction. According to, to my colleague who did calculate this uh, carefully, it is 23 times more than proposed in the previous uh, version. So, but but before I go to the to the health program, uh, EU for health, which we uh, we believe, you know, uh, as a commission, as as the Santa, that this is very big uh, challenge and, and, and also momentum for us. Uh, I would like to answer to the, to the question which was asked to this, to this, to this uh, webinar, how the health system respond to, the, to, the, to, the, to this crisis, you know, and, and we should start from the, from the very, very clear uh, kind of assessment that, you know, the, the health system they already were under constant uh, pressure of, of number of challenges already mentioned by, by previous speakers, aging population, you know, patients start to be play important role, you know, wanted to get more, you know, the acceptations of patients started to change. 
financial pressures, you know, all this, you know, squeezing, you know, uh, the size of the of the of the system, you know, modernization, you know, the the post financial crisis situation, austerity measures taken by by a number of governments, environmental issue, and so on and so on. So, what's happened with the with the COVID pandemic? You know, it seems like a, you know it was just a few weeks, but 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 we 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 have seen disruptive changes. And uh, they have highlighted the need for better organization and more resilience in the health system. I mean, the resilience of health system, this is the concept, you know, introduced uh, after uh, the last crisis, financial crisis, but, but, but now we, we, we really see the, the, the expression of this, of this concept, you know, in the old territories, not health only, but, but across the sectors. And I think this crisis is also showing that how health system is a part of the of the of the of, of almost everything. I think the, the first time, at least in my memory, of uh, as an expert, but also uh, working in the commission, you know, since 14 years, we see this 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 clearly. So, uh, you know, but of course, as you said when you started this meeting, you know, there are many uh, analysts published. Uh, Barbara referred to the very interesting good paper published in New England uh, a few weeks ago. There are many others, you know, uh, coming already published. But of course, the full lessons learned, you know, what really happened, you know, with the health systems and around the health system, we have still to, to, to wait to see. Uh, but I think slowly we can, we can see some, um, some examples, which I think I would like to, I have to highlight in my, in my, in my introduction. So just pick up the, the few few examples. So the first one, you know, primary healthcare providers were completely struggled by the by this by this uh, by this change. You know, the lack of equipment. You know, simple things, masks. You know, but then how to use them? You know, how frequently change them? All these sanitary measures. You know, were were coming. You know, as as as, as, as people were were starting to to use those those devices, very rarely before. Uh, and they were prompted with a with a teleconsultation. You know, some of them they did. Most of them never did the consultation. I spoke to one doctor. She told me that she feels like a, you know on telephone call. You know, from the day from the morning, the evening. And she said, "What I do? I do. I do my job." You know. Others said, "Do I am paid for this job?" So then we have uh, see the hospitals. You know how they uh, how they how they deal with the with the with the crisis. You know. Management, you know, supply of different goods, you know, the the the, the trained person, you know, how to prepare, are you trained, you know, are you can you do this job? You know, do we have uh, testing capacity to, to secure uh, our our uh, our colleagues, you know, providing uh, surgery or cardiac procedures? Then also we we started to see the in the social care facility very largely unaware. Of implication on unprepared uh, for this crisis, and, and of course, you know, we, we see the recorded uh, surge of infections and what in, 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 in those, those uh, home, homes. So we see also that the problem with something we will discuss in a number of years, you know, the integration you know, level between the different parts of the sectors, from paramedics to the to the ICU and to specialized care, you know, and, and of course this 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 COVID also showed, you know, how, how difficult is how difficult is transfer data, where that data is sitting, you know, how what is the, the quality of standards of the, of the data. Then we okay. come to the clinical activities. And as Barbara said, you know, that we started to see postponed treatment or patients, you know, fear to come because they were not secure. You know, we, we see in a number of countries, especially, you know, even cardiologists, I think, were the first to, 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 to explain patients, you know, about the risks, not coming to the hospital if you had uh, chest okay. pain. So, so, so we see also the, the kind of other type of uh, uh, new, 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 new situation we never okay. have seen before. You and, know, Andre, the Andre, can I just stop yeah. you there so we, and we can bring in some some other issues to talk about. Thank you for that. So we, let let me just wrap up that we've heard that health systems have responded. There's been unprecedented collaboration and work, but we've seen gaps 
particularly in our integration between health and our social care services. And sometimes it was the really simple stuff that was missing. It was the, the protection equipment and how to use it. We have a couple of people who'd like to intervene, and our first person is going to be coming from Zoom, and it's Suzanne Logstrup from the European Heart Network. Suzanne, we're going to put you up on the screen. Please go ahead. Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Tanson. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, basically, I'd like to follow up on, 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 the, on the, the all um, four interventions that we've had. Um, to a certain extent, I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that this uh, meeting today falls on the day where um, the presentation of the EU for Health program was, was, uh, was made by uh, Vice President of the European Commission and the Commissioner for Health, Mrs. Kyria Kiedis. Um, what is interesting, and I think this is, uh, in a sense, some of the, the key messages that we should, we should really focus on, one thing that we, we were sort of delighted to see in this program is that it has learned the lesson that it is important to tackle non-communicable diseases because without doing that, you're probably ending up with a higher um, mortality rate from a crisis like uh, COVID-19. So we, we certainly welcome that, uh, that that has, that if you like, it's been acknowledged clearly by, by the European Commission. Now, I would like to go back to um, the discussions around the patients that uh, either have been presented with the symptoms for heart, uh, heart attacks or strokes, or, and perhaps in particular right here, the patient whose um, appointments have been cancelled. We, we've got some very recent, we've got some figures from, uh, from the Netherlands, which, which estimate that the, the number of cardiovascular disease patients that will not receive the care they need this year could be somewhere between 150 and 200,000 people. This is just in the Netherlands. So, um, so I think this is a really big issue and, and, and a big problem uh, because those that have estimated those figures have also estimated that uh, the cancel, the cancelling or postponement of the of the care could lead to the loss of uh, somewhere between 65 and 100,000 life years and also potentially add up to about 20 to 50,000 life years in poorer health of CBD patients. So we have a situation where the people who've been most severely affected by COVID-19 are people with the, with the chronic non-communicable diseases and very much people with, patients with cardiovascular diseases. We also have a situation where there are so, some com complexities or com um, in, in, in what people who have developed cardiovascular, sorry, COVID-19, uh, into the extent that it may, they may end up with cardiovascular diseases as an outcome of COVID-19. And, um, and we may end up with a very big backlash for the patients, of course, the cardiovascular patients who have not received their care. Now, we have this new program. We have uh, 23 times, I heard you, Andre, more money now uh, allocated to it than the, pro the budget that was first proposed in 2018 in the, um, as part of the Social European Social Fund Plus. Um, but one of the things I think that very concretely, the, you know, the European Union could do to 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 help us uh, address um, cardiovascular diseases uh, more than it does right now is make sure that we get the data so we have a good picture of. Uh, I've given you some figures we just received from the Netherlands, but this is just a, a snapshot, and there um, there is need. There is a need for the European Union, for Europe, for the world, indeed, to get this data and really understand what it means for the future. And I think this would be interested in hearing from um, Andre. Uh, uh, you know, what are what is what is the uh, budgets that might be available for um, funding, uh, uh, data collection, registry, so uh, and the analysis of this data, um, whether now and here or in in the new program. So I'll, I'll stop here, potentially come back later. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Suzanne, and, and particularly for highlighting the, the potential impact in uh, people's overall health and potential mortality for the cardiovascular disease population who've been unable to get care for about three to four months, and, and we would expect to see an impact on their health. We've got a, that specific question to Andre to say, 
okay, how much money is foreseen in the new program, looking at improving our data collection so we can find out what's been happening in our health systems and how we can improve that. I appreciate that it's only just been announced and you may not have many details, but is there anything you can tell us, Andre, about what proportion of the time and focus is going to be looking at data collection? You know, the, <laughs> of course, we, we did a number of, of estimates, but I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's most important in this moment. What is, what is in the program, what you can, can find on the, 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 the health system strengthening part? We, we, we focus on a number of issues, but one of them is, is uh, one of them is very important is workforces, which I think I'd like to highlight is because it's, uh, it's, it's important that we would like to invest more in training, you know, and across uh, uh, European you know, programs, you know, to, to help with, uh, with the exchange of expertise and, and really enlarge this, this, this type of, of activities across, across professionals. And uh, I, I think cardiologists, of course, are also welcome to, to participate in this program. Uh, but uh, on data, first we have the uh, clearly stated in the commission uh, nomination letter that, that, that she worked and of course, consequently, we as a commission were working on the European health data space concept as a part of the, of the data strategy. And, uh, and this is the one important part of our work because, you know, to collect data, we also we have to build the system and, and most probably also regulatory governance uh, framework. The second, of course, is you know the collection of data. We have to have infrastructure, and this is what we like to invest to this program, including also some additional investment to to the regulatory system in in in, uh, in, in medicines and uh, most probably also medical devices because we need also collect you know clinical evidence you know to assess uh, medicines, medical devices, and get better you know in the in the kind of concept of value-based healthcare. So yes, there, there will be money there for infrastructure building, for, for building registers, for, for uh, developing, continue to develop standards and, and interoperability. Um, so how much will be allocated? This of course depends on the, on the, on the prioritization of, of, of spending, the readiness to, to spend those money and, and, okay. uh, and also the regulatory framework. Thank you, Andre. Let me now pass to our next input from Zoom. We have Florence Bertoletti, who's going to be sharing her question. Florence, the floor will be yours in just a second, and you'll need to unmute. There you go. Hello. Hello, everyone. Well, first of all, I want to say how excited I am to see some very familiar faces. Andre, of course, you, Tamsin, Suzanne, Barbara, and Elizabeth. It's wonderful to meet you. Uh, in this wonderful gathering. I just want to say a few words about the World Heart Federation so that you know who am I representing now because, yeah, I'm a familiar faces to some of you at EU level in different settings. So the World Heart Federation is the only CBD organization with official relations with the WHO and we unite the global uh, cardiovascular community and we have exciting members such as the European Heart Network and also the European Society of Cardiology as our trusted members uh, in Europe. Um, I just wanted to say that we are also developing a global uh, COVID-19 study, but this is not what really I wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, it's a comment. Uh, which is that uh, the EU has actually led uh, a, an amazing global resolution on the COVID-19 response at, at, at the world level, uh, which was adopted uh, at the World Health Assembly. So I want to applaud uh, the EU uh, for leading that. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but, in that resolution, uh, there is a specific reference to non-communicable diseases. So there's no reference to uh, one non-communicable disease being above another. Uh, they're all there. And my question, and this is going to Andre, having said all this, is given the fact 
that CVDs and circulatory conditions are clearly, I mean, it's been said quite a few times by other speakers, are clearly linked to, to COVID-19 risk factors, will the EC finally enshrine these conditions, i.e. CVD and circulatory health, in its future action plan as an essential element for success? And the reason why I'm asking this is I've seen at European level from a global point of view that you always, you know, cancer is everywhere and it should be, but it should not be at the detriment of other non-communicable disease. We don't see that at the global level. Why is it that at EU level, cancer is promoted more than CVDs and other NCDs? That's not fair. Okay. Thank you, Florence. We, we have an, another input that I'm going to take from Zoom now, and then I'll allow some of our speakers to respond. We have Yaroslav Fedorovsky. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Go ahead, please, Yaroslav. Hello, everyone. Greetings from the Polish Hospital Federation. Obviously, uh, I'm the president of the organization, but also a cardiologist by, by profession. We've been really working very hard to preserve uh, uh, the uh, capability of hospitals uh, to provide uh, services, uh, their procedures in, in place. But we've been observing something which, which, uh, which is uh, uh, quite astonishing recently uh, compared to uh, overall mortality uh, from uh, this uh, uh, 2020 March and April to uh, 2019 and 2018, uh, same overall mortality. We're actually seeing uh, less mortality than, uh, uh, than uh, those previous years. Uh, of, co of course, the topic is the time ticking bomb. So we, we wonder if this, could, uh, if this could happen in the near future. Uh, however, um, we, should, we should really keep, uh, keep a very close watch and uh, Polish Hospital Federation has just started a nationwide action called Don't Be Afraid of the Hospital. It's not to encourage people to go in crowds, but it's to show good practices uh, that, that hospitals are safe uh, with uh, precautions, with procedures, and we want our patients to be treated. So uh, if you're uh, supporting that, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, join us uh, on, on LinkedIn or Twitter, and I've been a member of Friends of Europe for quite uh, quite a time, and I thank you for a great uh, um, great opportunity to interact and discuss. Thank you for that. Now I'm going to bring in Nick Klesinska from the OECD. I, I referenced their recent report, which showed how the the slowdown in our life expectancy that we are seeing, because we've, we've been doing really well, we improved our life expectancy, but that's slowed down, and it's quite strongly linked to how we're doing on cardiovascular disease. Nick, would you like to add to that? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the, for, for the opportunity, and thank you for making this the theme today. Um, from an OECD perspective, we try, of course, to, to monitor what is going on in the, the various member states and are very much looking at the existing resilience. And doing that, it's very important to look at the whole disease pattern and mortality pattern. And as you rightly said, it, it, we, we just released two weeks ago a report which was based on work done before COVID that already shows that, that the mortality of, uh, of myocardial infarction, which was decreasing for about three to four decades, is slowing down less quickly in several countries and we did with the king's fund in-depth analysis of the causes i won't go in everything but it shows yes you have to pay attention to cardiovascular disease as well as to cancer as well as to the other group and there should be proportionality in the way how you look at system resilience in that respect it's all the major elements where were mentioned um, what we see is that countries where they have an inclusive approach of involving the citizens in the overall thinking about the healthcare systems, you get a quicker reduction of fear. As was said earlier, a lot of the postponement of seeking healthcare in hospitals, but also in primary care, is linked to fear. So how good are countries in, in involving citizens in, in getting the whole picture and 
rebuilding trust in the healthcare system where that is necessary. But a very important element of resilience surely is the, the data infrastructure, which was mentioned various times. And what we see is that in those countries that have a strong data infrastructure, where there is a linkage between administrative data, registries, electronic health records, and, and digital data, where they can produce real-time insights in where in your system are the, the bottlenecks than, and the others, those countries are better able to, to govern their country through the transition phase of this pandemic, which will most likely take another one year or one and a half, than the ones that can't do it. So real-time data, having insight in, in, in how many patients are postponing operations, are not seen by the GPs, are not going to the mental health care appointments, to get that overview quickly and in real time has put a lot of pressure on having good data infrastructure. So I sincerely hope that in the program of the EU, that aspect of having strengthening the data infrastructure is focused rather than having new data sets. There are sufficient data. It's how we use them, how we link them, and how we make them available for our governance. So just wanted to add that. And then, of course, that is linked to the technology. Of course, we've, we've monitored a lot of telehealth and, and change of different delivery formats. But that also poses an, an, a possibility in the coming time to, to redesign our systems. And when doing that, and that's my final remark, and I kind of hear that in, in the way how people are talking about it, we should see it far more as complex systems where we have to in increase the, the, the capabilities of responding. That's also signaled by the word resilience. That means stepping away from the more linear planning-like way of looking at our systems, which compartmentalize things, but really seeing how within the systems we can make the interlinkages. And again, a, a good data infrastructure fed by technological support with inclusiveness of the, 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 the patients and the citizens it seems to be key in uh, achieving that. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to invite um, some of the other members of the panel to respond on some of these, these points. Pr Professor Cassidy and Jean-Luc, maybe you could respond on these elements about the better organized health systems have done better, the ones where you have more collaboration, you have sharing of information, you have sort of better connection into the primary care systems. How do you think we move forward with this? Um, uh, Professor Cassidy, from your, your, how are the cardiologists and the clinicians going to organize themselves better ha for the data sharing to be part of this knowledge gathering? And for Jean-Luc, how is the industry going to do things differently to meet some of these new challenges that our, our speakers have put forward? Let me start with Professor Cassidy. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, I must say uh, I was uh, uh, agreeing uh, with everything uh, the uh, um, Dr. Klazinka was saying, um, I do feel the problem very keenly. As a president of the um, European Society of Cardiology, I have been trying to build an initiative which is called the EuroHub, which is continuous patients uh, registry uh, across uh, countries. And it is true uh, that uh, there are a lot of data available in some countries, but as it often happens in Europe, there is a, a level of inequality also in that good, uh, in, in that kind of goods. So that, you know, you have uh, countries like uh, typically the Northern countries who are very well organized and very well connected. And then you have countries that have absolutely nothing in place. And that is where uh, we want to focus. But you see, and, and society, uh, professional society can only go so far because to have continuous patient registry, you need the political will. So the, the country uh, needs to want to have it. And uh, the health system need to be able to finance it and believe that this is the way forward. Uh, and there are many advantages in having the data collection so quality, even from administrative data or uh, uh, slim registries, uh, including the ability to do clinical trials within uh, registries uh, in a much more streamlined and cost-effective way. So there is a return. But uh, the, the obstacle is really to convince uh, the political will, uh, the country, to invest uh, in such a structure. Okay, 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cassidy. Jean-Luc, would you like to add some comments on some of the, the comments that came from our, our different speakers and our people who sent in questions about how we do things better, how we collaborate, more importantly, how we share our data so that our health systems can be better organized for the future? I, I guess um, from an industrial standpoint, um, this, as, as I said, this uh, crisis is showing the utilization of some technology which are connecting the physician and the patient. At high, high level, uh, strong demand, very efficient, and probably somehow very simple. Now, how this, all those things are going to, to evolve? Um, definitively, uh, the investment we are planning uh, and we are doing in the cardiovascular area are focusing on a couple of, uh, of elements uh, for cardiovascular uh, disease. And th the COVID, as I said, has shown the interest of that. What we, we try to do with technology is to make sure we provide the, the, the clinician, the practitioner with technology which allows them to go very minimal invasive when they have to do an intervention to limit all the length of stay uh, in hospital, which in this situation, COVID has proven to be a good strategy and to have them back uh, quickly uh, on track in their life. So this is probably uh, what the industry is doing, uh, has been doing. We have been uh, highlighted with uh, all this telehealth. The fact we are strategically engaged at working with the community with, uh, with the doctor, with the hospital, with the payer to find technology which follow a better treatment of the cardiovascular disease by reducing length of stay is something which we are going to maintain. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time um, together in the live stream. So I've got, I'm going to invite our, our last two panel members to respond on specific things. And I'm going to start with Brando Benefi because... Professor Cassidy just said, it's about political will. Our country's going to invest in strengthening their health systems. Uh, is the population going to be led forward in a way that helps them trust the systems and so they can take better care of themselves? Let me ask about the European Parliament. All legislation passes through your doors. You have po tremendous potential to have an impact on the way our food is developed and marketed, on alcohol, on smoking, on physical activity, on green spaces, on transport. We have lots of opportunities for the parliament to show political will. What can you say about where you think that can happen? Brando Benefe. Yes, well, um, I, I would say that uh, the parliament has proven already in a few, more than a few occasions when it had to vote on these topics, um, that it was ready to defend the interests uh, of uh, citizens, uh, of their health care, uh, in a very strong way, in uh, promoting a more uh, healthy lifestyle and uh, the um, and the uh, an attention on the on this on this front. Um, I, I have to say that uh, it's, the problem is more uh, in other places. Uh, it's more in the attitude of the, um, in the, gov of the governments, in my, in my opinion, that sometimes have been uh, blocking decisions that were important, simply because, as you know, the council way of deciding is less um, a majority decision-making style uh, than the European Parliament. I want to be clear, I'm not referring to the fact that on some topics uh, the councils or the governments as co-legislators have to decide in unanimity. This is something we know, but that's a legal requirement. What I'm referring to is the race to the bottom in terms of finding low-level compromises, even when it would be possible to vote uh, uh, as a majority and not to be stopped by one or two member states. So I see um, this uh, uh, need to step up the political will. Uh, I see it connected to the need to reform uh, and to support a more 
um, practical and more uh, um, a quicker and, and less uh, obstructionist uh, uh, way of deciding from the government side. Uh, okay. I, I don't think these things are, uh, are separate because if we have a system where on controversial okay. issues there is a de facto veto power that is based on um, uh, the diplomatic attitude that prevails inside the council. It's not linked again to the rules, it's linked to a, an attitude. And we see that very clearly, there are a lot of studies. About Brando, this. We're, we're, I'm sorry, we're almost out of time. And I do have one other person who wanted to come in. It will be Neil Johnson okay. from the Global sorry, Heart Hub. I, I try to speak as, the, as much as the others, but <laughs> to conclude, uh, um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a matter of making the whole of the institutions ready to take this, uh, uh, this ambition. I think the parliament is ready. I don't see Good. The, the problem with the parliament. Excellent, thank you. We're going to go to Neil Johnson from the Global Heart Hub for our, our final comment. Thank before you, we thank, go you to, for, uh, thank you, thank Neil. You, can you, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, can you hear me okay? We can, we can't see yeah. you. No, okay, so I'm um, representing the Global Heart Hub, which is uh, in effect the, ter the first attempt to bring together the heart patient community to give voice in a structured way to heart patients. And, um, and we're growing in strength. Uh, uh, about uh, 60 patient organizations are now affiliated. And a, a recent survey conducted across 19 countries confirmed what some of the speakers have already uh, indicated, that the number one fear in heart patients is contracting COVID, and the second fear is going to hospital or going to their doctor. So. The clinical societies have issued messages to reassure patients, and in the coming days, uh, the patient community will now similarly uh, convey messages and hopefully develop a confidence-building campaign for patients to put their heart emergencies before um, COVID. But I think it's very important that the clinicians come behind that campaign and endorse it. So I will, of course, be writing to Professor Cassidy in, a, in a official capacity and I'd ask her that the um, European Society and that the uh, World Heart Federation would come behind the patient voice and encourage patients, and then not only encourage them to come forward and, and address these cardiac emergencies, but then to be there for them when they arrive at the hospitals and make sure that the pathway is safe. It is um, tragic to hear coronary care nurses, for example, say to me this week that going into coronary care units now, it's like going back 40 years ago patients presenting with deterioration of the heart as a result of staying at home too long and not um, realizing the seriousness of not taking appropriate and emergency uh, steps when experiencing new symptoms or worsening uh, symptoms with existing uh, cardiac conditions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, and again, for highlighting that the transformation that COVID is happening, some of it is absolutely devastating to the way that patients are experiencing their conditions. We're now going to wrap up our session with a last quick soundbite from each of our panel members. And I'll start with Professor C uh, Cassidy. If there was one take home message you wanted everyone to remember from this, what is it? What would we do if we didn't uh, accept uh, all the constraints in which uh, we have been working. Uh, you know, the COVID has really taught us that uh, things can be done, uh, you know, so much better, more efficiently, quicker, uh, has really highlighted what we need uh, and uh, how we're going to use it. So we must not waste that lesson. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jean-Luc. We mustn't waste the lesson that we can do things differently. What would you like to leave as a final message? Final message is we need to, to work together again and again, similar to what happened with the management of this crisis today, for uh, stopping, reducing uh, the cardiovascular disease. And the, the message is definitively we need to articulate uh, some partnership we have not done yet and to ensure that the proper technology, the proper therapy has brought as quick as possible uh, to, the, to, the, to the patient having cardiovascular and being properly diagnosed. Thank you. Brando, 
I know that in, as part of the MEP Heart Group, you called for a healthy aging uh, strategy. And we've had one, one of our questions came from the audience, you know, when are we going to get a proper strategy on circulatory disease, which is so linked to many of our chronic conditions? What would you like the Parliament to have as its key message on this? Well, I think that the key message is that we cannot waste any more time. As it was clearly explained from the arguments in this debate, uh, we are already late. So we need to, to react, uh, to be uh, active, uh, um, and the parliament is ready to, to pick up <laughs> uh, a fight so that there is uh, not uh, the, the, the... This priority is not forgot, because we, we, we heard there are... There are many issues re related to, to healthcare, but this is a really, really important one that must not be lo lost behind in, in a different uh, set of priorities. Okay, thank you very much. Andre, final message, and there's, there's a, a challenge from our, from our audience, which is the, the European Commission has its it plans on cancer. It, obviously, it's an appropriate priority given how many people are affected, but COVID-19 has shown us just how vulnerable our population is in the area of cardiovascular disease. So do you foresee that we will have some kind of strategy or process that will address circulatory diseases in the next five years? Andre. So first, uh, you know, the, 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 the current program we propose today, uh, Health for you, you for Health, sorry, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's first respond, you know, if, uh, we, we already are doing, you can read this, you know, and you will see that the, we are speaking about the chronic diseases, we are speaking of prevention, we are also, of course, addressing data, digitalization, also crisis management. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a first step. We continue to work on this agenda because the front to fork is also speaking about the, the, the diet, about the, 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 the issues you many, many NGOs call, called before. Data strategies on the way. This is again the response to your call, and we should not also forget. You know, we continue our journey in tobacco front. Next year, we we supposed to and we will present the report of five years of the of the current directive. There are a number of challenges ahead of us. So, I you know I I can tell you, and I promise uh, we 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 COVID also speed up our work. You know, show the flexibility. Commission show flexibility. We show that we can work. We hear and we can respond. And I think now is the, the challenge, you know, how to use resources and time as best as we can together, patients, professionals, and politicians. Thank, thank you very much. So I think the overall message for me is watch this space. We are at a very exciting moment, the launch of a brand new potential program with a significant amount of funds. We've heard from Brando that the European Parliament is invigorated and that the European Council have got health right in the heart of their mandate. And they've clearly seen that health is wealth. If we don't support better population health, we won't survive as a European society, let alone thrive. So there's an opportunity here for change. And I hope you've enjoyed our conversation. For those of you who've participated in Zoom, please feel free to stay around when the live stream ends and you'll have an opportunity to chat with the other members of the audience and to share some of your views. The recording of this event will be available on the Friends of Europe website in the coming hours or even days. And we have a few more events coming up for you in the next few days, which we'll be showing for you on the screen. Thank you very much for participating. Take care of yourselves, take care of your heart. Take advantage of the opportunity to get out and exercise and feel better. And we hope to see you at another Friends of Europe virtual event in the coming days. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>